show trials, purges of intellectuals, rivals of Stalin, people wearing glasses, I'm wearing contact. Um, the, the truth is that that was only the tip of the iceberg. The party purges, the military purges, were only about 50,000 of the 700,000 murders. The main targets of the terror were first, peasants, and second, ethnic minorities. The Kulak action, an action directed against politically suspect peasants, killed about 400,000 people. How do you become a politically suspect peasant? You survive collectivization, and you survive a five-year sentence in the Gulag, in the Soviet concentration camp system. You come back in 1936, 37, 38. That's suspicious. Um, and Stalin suspects, more or less reasonably, that people who have that experience might not be friendly to the regime. Many, uh, roughly 400,000 people are killed for this reason. The second group of targets were ethnic minorities. Nationalities within the Soviet Union that were assumed to have some kind of connection to states beyond the Soviet Union. About a dozen ethnic actions led to the death of 250,000 people. In all of these cases, all 700,000 individuals by night shot one by one in the back of the neck um, with an engine in the background or far away in a forest where no one would hear. In the largest of these ethnic actions, the Polish action, uh, something like 110,000 Soviet citizens were shot on bogus charges of being spies for for Poland. The next chapter, chapter four, is a very crucial one because it's a chapter that concerns the alliance between Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in 1939, which lasts until 1941. It's important because it means that organs of Soviet terror move west into the Baltic states, into eastern Poland. It's important because this is the moment when German organs of terror first began to kill and deport on a large scale. Up until the war, the Germans had put about 20,000 people in camps. They killed a few hundred or at most a couple thousand people. The violence was on a horrible scale by the standards of civilized, let's say, observers, but it was on a scale which was far, far, far lower than violence in the Soviet Union. The invasion of Poland permits institutions like the Einsatzgruppe, these special murderous task forces. The invasion of Poland is what leads to the ghettoization of Jews. The invasion of Poland is what leads to massive ethnic cleansing. So, the, the destruction of Poland, this alliance, is important because it allows the Soviets to continue what they were doing, allows the Germans to escalate. But it's important for a more fundamental reason as well. It's important because of the destruction of states. Now, this is again a point which I feel like I should stress during the Republican debates, but the state is a very important thing. The state is not something which can be tossed away lightly. The entire tradition of Western political thought is about the relationship between the individual and the states. The same is true about the entire tradition of Jewish political thought. And what happens when states are destroyed is quite horrible for everyone, and especially for Jews. This is a point which never gets mentioned, and I'm, I'm waiting to be corrected on this, but it never gets mentioned in the Holocaust literature. When people write about the Holocaust, they generally write about the people of Eastern Europe as though they were just ethnicities, which is, of course, how the Germans saw it. The Holocaust literature always starts after states are destroyed. But of course, it is very important that states are destroyed. Estonia is destroyed, Latvia is destroyed, Lithuania is destroyed, Poland is destroyed. Why is this so important? I mean, I can give you some of the mechanisms. When there's no rule of law, the police, the same people who protected Jews from pogroms in 1930, are now working for the Germans to carry out pogroms, a very fundamental difference. When there's no rule of law, peasants and others are able to take property from Jews in a way which would have been inconceivable before. But also, when states are destroyed, that means that elites from these states can see the Germans as liberators, which is important in the Lithuanian case. That leads to a pattern of collaboration which is inconceivable without the prior destruction of the Lithuanian state. Now, as it, that's, those are just some of the particular mechanisms, but let me give you a generalization. For the Holocaust as a whole, if you were a Jew in, in, in Europe in the 1930s or 40s, if you lived in one of these zones where statehood was destroyed, your chances of surviving was 1 in 20. If you lived in a place which was an ally of Nazi Germany, or was Nazi Germany, your chances of surviving were 1 in 2, which is of course horrible, but rather different from 1 in 20. <laughs> 
which suggests, I think it's very suggestive, that this process of state destruction was rather important to what happens next. And that's, that's why I'm going on it now. The next chapter, chapter five, is about political economy. Because I think people who make it to the middle of the book should be rewarded with something really exciting. <laughs> Now, the, the reason that chapter 5 is about political economy has to do with the things I was trying to stress earlier. The Germans had a vision for what they were going to do in Eastern Europe. And the only way to understand what they actually did is to see how that vision comes into contact with, let's call it reality, with resistance from various forces in the world, like the Red Army. The vision had four parts. In the vision, there was going to be what the Germans called a Blitzsieg, a lightning victory. The Soviet Union was going to fall apart after the attack in nine weeks. That was the idea. Nine weeks. Um, it was going to be a cakewalk. It was a giant with feet of clay. Hitler said it was going to fall like a house of cards. Familiar metaphors. It was going to be an easy war. That was the idea. The whole Soviet Union was going to fall down. The second thing which was going to happen was that in the first fall and winter after the war, so the fall and winter of 1941, the Germans in occupied Western Soviet Union were going to starve 30, 3 zero, 30 million Soviet citizens to death as a way of making sure they were fed themselves and as a way of getting rid of people they regard as unnecessary. Then, in the 10 to 15 years following the war, which again, to remind you, was supposed to be over in summer of 1941, in the 10 to 15 years following the war, the Germans were going to carry out colonization. They were going to move and starve further tens of millions of people, and they were going to turn the Western Soviet Union into an agrarian colony for themselves. Little towns, nice white picket fences, Himmler referred to them as pearls of settlement. The remaining Slavs would be slave laborers living in separate suburbs, and the Jews would be eliminated, which is the fourth thing which they meant to do. Up until this point, the summer of 1941, the German determination to eliminate Jews from Europe had been steady but no way to do so had been found. There were various deportation schemes, all of which proved impractical for one reason or another. In the summer of 1941, the idea was, we're going to drive the Jews eastward. Heidegger fantasized about putting them into the gulag, into the Soviet concentration camps. We're going to ethnically cleanse them eastward. This, of course, is not possible. I can't give you the whole argument of chapter five, but let me just give you this example. The, the Germans can't drive the Jews eastward because the Soviet Union doesn't fall apart. The Red Army resists quite effectively. Um, they can't starve the population because people don't starve themselves. You have to have really exquisitely perfect control over territory to starve people. Where the Germans did have that control, they did starve. They starved in the siege of Leningrad, in which a million people were killed. They starved in their own prisoner of war camps, where they deliberately killed something like three million Soviet prisoners of war. That was their second greatest war crime but they couldn't carry out these grand plans as they imagined them. What they did instead was focus on the Jewish problem um, and escalate it. That is, rather than driving the Jews east, which was impossible, they continued to kill them. They had killed them as the invasion began, and now when the invasion faltered, they blamed the Jews for that, and they killed them. Um, they began, they shifted to killing women and children, they shifted to exterminating whole communities. By the end of 1941, in the occupied Soviet Union, the thing which we call the Holocaust was well underway. About a million Jews had already been killed, almost all of them by gunfire. In 1942, the Holocaust shifts to the image which is more familiar to us, that of these death facilities where people were gassed in occupied Poland. So I spend the rest of the book discussing the course of the Holocaust, first in the Baltics and Ukraine, then in Belarus, and, and then the death facilities in occupied Poland. Let me close with just a couple of thoughts. I want to make clear, if I haven't already, what the book is not. This book is not a comparison. Why is it not a comparison? In a comparison, you take two things and you separate them. And then you say, what's alike and what's different? So for example, I'm standing on stage, you're sitting down, I'm wearing a tie, most of you are not. I'm talking, most of you are not. Um, <laughs> This book is much more about an interaction. So, in other words, if I ever stop talking, you will start asking questions. Um, we will be having a conversation. There will be an interaction. My behavior will no longer be explicable by me alone. It will only be explicable in terms of some sort of interaction. Right? A very simple analogy, but you see what I'm getting at. 
that the book is not about taking the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and separating them analytically. It's about observing the territory where they were both present. That's quite different from a comparison, not least because it's more modest. In order to compare things, you have to assume that you know everything about the two things you're comparing, which I don't think we do. In fact, I think it's precisely the absence of, of, of observing this interaction which has prevented us from learning many of the things about the individual regimes that we haven't understood. That's so, so if the two regimes interacted, how do they interact? They interacted in the ways I've suggested. They had rival schemes for how to develop, to concern the same territory, to modernize or demodernize. They cooperated in the destruction of states. They cooperated in the beginning of the Second World War. If we believe the Second World War is a central tragedy of the century, we have to ask how to begin. It began with a Soviet-German alliance. Um, it began no other way. One can imagine it beginning some other way, but in fact, it began with a Soviet-German alliance. More interestingly and more paradoxically, they also interact after they're at war with each other. Um, the Soviet secret police leave are, are, are literally shooting and deporting people in the days when, right before the Germans invade the Soviet Union. So they leave behind prisons full of corpses. The deportation trains going to the heart of the Soviet Union are literally being bombed by the German Air Force. So the, the, the timing of things is such that the populations which the Germans are coming into quote unquote liberate have just experienced the worst of Soviet power, which makes things worse for everyone. They interact in, in crimes like the murder of the prisoners of war. The, Germans, the German policy was to starve prisoners. The reason they took so many prisoners was that Stalin wouldn't let people surrender. If you surrendered, your, your, your wife and children would be, would be imprisoned. That was the law. Now, that doesn't make the, the policy a Soviet policy, but it does show how, without a certain kind of interaction, um, the scale of death wouldn't be possible. Or, to give you an example that goes beyond the book, Think of the Gulag for a second, the, the system of Soviet concentration camps, which is, for the most part, way off in the east, beyond this theater, beyond this interaction. In the Gulag, there are two years which are truly fatal. Um, well, three. 1941, 1942, and 1943. More people die in those years than in the rest of the history of the Gulag up to that point. Why is that? Well, they have been imprisoned by the Soviets, but they die because of the German invasion of the Soviet Union which cuts off logistics, denies them food supplies, because they're, of course, at the bottom of the list of priorities. Their deaths cannot be explained, in other words, except by reference to both systems. And that's true for an awful lot of people in this zone. Now, let me close with one more remark. I've just explained why this book isn't a comparison. But of course, when you look at the two regimes in their interaction, you are brought to certain comparative thoughts and I want, to make, I, want to, I, want to, I want to pause for a moment to defend the legitimacy of that, um, because I think it's rather important. If we're not allowed to have comparative thoughts, there's no way we can do history, right? If I say to you, as I said by chance in this lecture, that um, the Gulag had more than a million inmates at a time when the, Soviet, when the German concentration camp had about 20,000, that's a comparison. I can't really stop myself from saying that. I could say to you, the Soviets, rather than the Germans, were the first to shoot people in the scale of the hundreds of thousands on ethnic grounds. It's a comparison. It's just true. How should I police my thoughts so that I don't reach those comparisons? What should I tell my students so they don't notice these comparisons? I think it would be absurd to avoid these things. It's all the more absurd because of the experience of the locals. If you spend a lot of time with the primary sources, with Jewish testimonial material, with the material of Ukrainian, Polish, other survivors, you realize very quickly that everyone in this zone compared. They all compared for the very simple reason that they had experience with both systems. They were condemned to compare. If they wanted to survive, they had to calculate for themselves and their families under which system it was less bad to be. If the Wehrmacht is invading Poland from one side and the Red Army is invading Poland from the other side, and you're a Jew in Poland, in Warsaw, let's say, in 1939, you have to decide what to do. You have to make a comparison. If you're a Ukrainian peasant starving in 1933, you might dream of a German invasion because you think, how could this possibly be worse? When the German invasion came, by the way, most Ukrainian peasants decided that it was worse, which was a comparative judgment, which they had no choice but to make because of the nature of their experience. In other words, 
not comparing as a luxury which we can allow ourselves at a distance of decades and a distance of thousands of miles, but it's not a luxury that the people who generated the primary sources have. Now, that said, I understand why people worry about comparisons. They worry that if you compare things, if you put things together, if you juxtapose them, if you talk about interactions, if you, if you deny the false purity according to which most history operates, you'll somehow diminish a particular crime. Um, in Eastern Europe, this crime is not always the Holocaust. In Western Europe, and Central Europe, and America, it almost always is. So let me say a word about the Holocaust. It seems to me that really the exact opposite is true. In the case of the Holocaust, as in the case of all important events, I have to say, despite what I've just said about the Republican debates, here I am a free trader and not a protectionist. I believe that the thing to do is to take all the evidence into account, sort it out, and see what this brings you. That the protectionist impulse to try to protect events from, from, from evidence is ultimately counterproductive because it's transparent to other historians and to other people what you're doing, but it also doesn't help in your arguments, it hurts them. In other words, I think good history is good for us, and I think bad history is, is, is bad for us. I have a strong presumption for good history. I think this approach to the Holocaust, that is writing about it on the territory where it happens, means that we're seeing the victims from their own perspective and not just as the Germans saw them, which is important. It means that we're seeing the Holocaust against its historical setting and we're anchoring that as an historical event. But it also means that we can actually make what I think is the first true comparison. And there's always a lot of talk about whether you can't compare the Holocaust, what it means if you did, and so on and so forth. But until you bring the Holocaust together, with the other crimes that were committed on the territory where it was committed, you can't actually issue a proper comparison. Um, in this book, I can. And, and, and what I can say is this. It's not just the case that the Holocaust was the only policy which was designed to exterminate an entire people, which it was. It's also the case that the Holocaust took more lives than any other Soviet or German policy. In other words, it was not only qualitatively distinct, it was also quantitatively much worse than anything else. This, by the way, is the single most radical formulation of the unprecedented character of the Holocaust that exists in historical literature. Up until now, Holocaust historians, until I've stopped them, said, on the one hand, the Soviets killed more, but on the other hand, the Holocaust was special because of its racial distinctiveness. Only half of that is true. The Holocaust is special because of its racial distinctiveness. But the Soviets did not, in fact, kill more. The Germans killed more. But you can only make this radical claim when you have everything else in the picture. But, 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 that is not really what my book is about, as I stress. It's not a book about comparisons. It's a book about the fate of individual human beings. It's a book about the logics and the policies which took the lives of 14 million people. And if you'll permit me, I just want to conclude with a further word about that number. The number 14 million, or any big number, 6 million, 3 million, 1 million, the number is important because of its weight, because, it, because it's so heavy, because it's so large. But it's also important because of, let's say, its tender precision. I tried very hard to get the numbers right. And I did this not just because I wanted to know how big the total number was. It's because that I believe that the big number is made up of a series of smaller numbers. That ultimately the big number is made up of individuals. In other words, when one thinks 14 million in this context, <coughs> one shouldn't think 14 million. One should think something like 14 million times 1, where the difference between 0 and 1 is not just some sort of generic unit, where the difference between zero and one is an individual, each different from the individual before, the individual after, where the difference between zero and one is something like an infinity. I think history is a humanity. It's about individual human beings, which means that this sort of book is at the edge of what history can do, but I think it's at the center of what history has to do. So I've given you a sense of what the book is about. I've given you a sense of why I wrote it the way I did. I've given you a brief overview of the chapters. I've given you some thoughts about interaction and comparison. What I hope the book succeeds in doing, even if it's not persuasive on all these other levels, is in conveying this particular tragedy. It's conveying the, the significance of the loss of all of this life. So if you'll permit me, I'd like to give you 
the names of the three people I mentioned at the beginning, because all 14 million of the victims I described in this book had names. The Ukrainian man who dug his own grave, his name was Petro Veli. The Polish officer who kept a diary, his name was Adam Solsky. The young Jewish woman who left a message for her mother on the wall of the synagogue, her name was Dolce Kagan. From Hitler and Stalin, from these two regimes, from history, we have inherited these, these big numbers. The modest goal of this book, but maybe the most difficult goal of this book, was to try to take those numbers and turn them back into people. Thank you very much.